Welcome to today's webinar, everyone. NGO Disaster Preparedness Program's role of local NGOs in DRR and launching of community practice. Brought to you by the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction and Give to Asia with support from the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. My name is Louis John Aguila, the learning lead of the Humanitarian Leadership Academy Philippines. To start the webinar, I'll provide an orientation of the platform so that you all know how to use it and how to interact with us. As participants, you should see several buttons on your screen depending on the type of device that you're connecting with. These buttons will likely be in the top left-hand corner of your screen or on the bottom of your screen. The first button you should see is your audio settings. This is where you can adjust your settings if you're not able to hear me very well or if you want to connect a new piece of hardware such as a pair of headphones. Next to this is the chat which you can use uh, to introduce yourself to the panelists. You can also tell us your name and your organization, and perhaps if you'd also like to share a little bit about your experiences on this topic and what you hope to learn today, for example. Next to the chat button is raise hand. So we won't be using this function today. If you have any questions, then please just post them straight away using the Q&A button, which is right beside it. Uh, the Q and A button is the main functionality that we'll be using that you will be using to interact with us. Please do post any questions that you have. Feel free to do so throughout the webinar's presentations and discussions. My colleagues and I will be online and responding to all those that we can as they come through in writing, and we'll also post the, the the other questions directly to our panel of speakers during our dedicated open forum, which will be held towards the end of the webinar. Please also know that if we do run out of time and we're, we aren't able to answer any of your questions, we will do so after the webinar alongside a link to the recorded version of this webinar, which you can rewatch or share with colleagues or within your networks for those who couldn't make it today. That's about it for the platform introduction. I'll hand the floor over to our webinar's moderator, Wilson John Barbon of IIRR. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you, Louis, for, uh, for that uh, orientation about the platform. Uh, I think this is, uh, we will be experiencing some, uh, uh, forgive us if, if there are some glitches and some challenges technically, but we will, we will make do with, uh, you know, with, with what we have prepared for you. And we'll try our best to give you the best uh, webinar experience we can offer. So the title of our webinar is the, the role of local NGOs in DRR. Uh, and this is also a launching of uh, our website of the community of practice that uh, IIRR and Give to Asia have uh, you know, worked together in putting this up uh, as, a, as a landing platform for our uh, local NGOs. So for this webinar, we have uh, I, I am here in Yangon together with uh, members of the local organizations who are members of two big uh, local NGO networks here in Myanmar. So the first uh, local NGO who is kind enough to allow us to use their facility, the Food Security Working Group. Uh, is, uh, this is their uh, conference room and we have some of their members uh, who are joining me in this conference room. Uh, aside from that, we also have uh, representatives from the Myanmar Consortium uh, for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is our active partner in the community of practice uh, here in Myanmar and in the region. So MCDRR is a key regional alliance of NGOs that represents the, the, the DRR sector of uh, Myanmar. So all of them are uh, inside and joining me and listening uh, to, to our uh, webinar. And I, I think we also have a number of guests uh, who have uh, participants who have signed up uh, uh, for, for this webinar. So what are the objectives? So the, we have two objectives for this uh, webinar. One is uh, we want to build awareness among local NGOs and other stakeholders in Asia about the evolving roles of local NGOs as well as the challenges that confronts them in disaster risk reduction work. So there's a lot of been discussion about the, the, the growing uh, participation and involvement of local NGOs in DRR in Asia. So we want to build awareness on, in, at that level. The second objective is uh, we want to, uh, we hope that with this webinar, 
we will be able to create more uh, buy-in among our stakeholders, partners, and uh, you know service providers, capacity development institutions to participate and support our local uh, NGO community of practice, which uh, to date we have about 100 local NGOs across uh, eight countries in Asia that have participated in IRRR and Give to Asia events, learning events that uh, you know put them, yeah, like gather them to talk about <laughs> what kind of support they need so that they will have more impact, they achieve the scale that they need and uh, more sustainability for their programs. So we have, for this webinar, we have prepared uh, two speakers, two guests. So our first uh, big speaker is uh, Dr. Jan Batten. So Dr. Jan Batten is uh, not stranger to IRRR. Uh, he used to lead our international training and outreach program. And uh, he's back in the Philippines now. But uh, before going back to the Philippines, he has been with uh, key international NGOs uh, like Care International, and he used to be the, the CEO of Action Aid in the UK. And uh, he's very passionate about local NGOs and community-driven development. Dr. Yen, our founder, uh, referred John as like one of the rural reconstruction uh, eagles. And uh, so, John, John will share to us uh, his uh, experience, his opinion about, about local NGOs in Asia, what are some of their challenges, as well as some prescriptions, some tips on what should be the way forward for local NGOs so that we will be able to be more effective in our programs, we achieve more impact and, uh, and, and sustainability. So our second speaker is uh, speaking from San Francisco, uh, she is the development manager for disaster programs, uh, Ms. Shina Agarwal. Uh, she is with the organization, our partner organization, the Give to Asia, which is based in San Francisco. Shina will share to us about this Give to Asia and IRRR joint project who, uh, referred as the NGO Disaster Preparedness Program or the NGO DPP. Uh, she will share to us why we have uh, you know, implemented this project, and what are some of the highlights of our of our uh, achievements so far, and what are the future directions of this program? So I will not uh, take more time in this uh, introduction. I will now hand over to uh, John to share uh, his uh, presentation and what he has to tell us. John, thank you very much, Wilson, and good day to everyone around Asia. It's a great pleasure for me to be speaking to you all on this first webinar about the uh, challenges of building relevant and sustainable uh, local NGOs in uh, Asia. The first question I was asked to address is why and how local NGOs are increasing in numbers. Um, I think the main points I want to highlight on this first slide about the local NGO sector is that when I visit a country, quite often the size, the vibrance, the strength of the local NGO sector is very much a reflection of the state of development in that country. The, um, for me, a healthy sector, which is growing all the time, uh, is a very positive thing. Uh, the people are, of course, the strength of a nation, and the stronger people's organizations are, then the stronger the nation tends to become. So I think as we enter the NGO sector for the first time, we should be prepared to recognize that it is a very dynamic sector, and it is a rapidly growing one. It certainly isn't one that stays the same. Uh, and therefore, of course, uh, if one wants to use private sector language, it's a very competitive sector. Although for many of us, working together on common goals is a really important uh, uh, aspect of our, of our work. So um, the, uh, the growth of the NGO sector in any country is very much dependent on the uh, political environment, the economic environment, and the social cultural tradition 
um, in many countries when the political system opens up, uh, there's no stopping civil society people from organizing themselves and pushing their own development agendas. And that's, of course, a very positive uh, thing. And the stronger the economy becomes, the more resources there are for this sector to, uh, to grow. Uh, some countries, the uh, government keeps quite strong control over registration and certification of, of NGOs. Um, this can uh, limit uh, the speed with which the sector grows, but one can appreciate that there needs to be some level of uh, control and registration in, in any nation. Uh, so we have to work uh, within, within those uh, parameters. Um, also, I think uh, in the context of this talk, we should recognize that not all NGOs aspire to become sustainable. Uh, some NGOs exist for short-term goals, for short-term reasons. And when they've achieved those objectives, they uh, close down or they become inactive. So, but I think here we're looking at uh, long-term development goals and we are looking at organizations that aspire to become uh, sustainable. The second question I was asked is sort of key issues that confront local NGOs in Asia. Um, and uh, I think there are many. Uh, I've identified six here for you to consider. Um, the first is the governance and leadership of NGOs. Um, quite often, NGOs are established by one visionary, committed uh, individual, or perhaps a small team. But for sustainability, there needs to be a separation between the governance of the organization and the overall management of it. And there needs to be a healthy balance between that governance and the uh, leadership. Uh, in the private sector, of course, you have company owners. In NGOs, we don't have that. Um, but we do need a strong governance group to be both accountable uh, for what the organization uh, is, uh, is doing. Uh, another challenge, I think, faced by many NGOs, particularly in the early days of founding, is the majority tend to be program driven, started by people who are really committed to the issues that they're addressing with the communities. And quite often they have not started with strong financial systems, uh, with, with strong cost controls. And as soon as you start to expand and get external fund funding, uh, this is a make or break issue for many NGOs. Um, quite often the first paid professional staff that an NGO will hire will be their finance controller um, and that's almost the natural growth of, a, of an NGO. If you fail to do that early on you can be uh, in, a lot, in a lot of difficulty when you start to expand your programs and your, uh, and your funding base. Program impact of course uh, we see firsthand when we're working at the community level but uh, Documenting and reporting on that uh, is also essential for future, uh, future fundraising. Resource mobilization is a big issue, of course. Where do we get the money to do our work? And the, the only quick advice I can say here is diversify as much as you can. Uh, sustainable NGOs are not built on single donors, neither are they built on single sources of funding. You have to find a variety of sources. People management, of course, while we uh, rely on volunteers a lot and the commitment of our staff, uh, they still need to be managed, uh, supported and developed. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we can't work in isolation from others. We need to invest in our networking and uh, communication with others. Maybe I'll just finish, uh, I see I've just got a minute or so left, on prescriptions moving forward uh, to become more relevant and sustainable. Um, of course, understanding the context you're working in, uh, clarity of your vision, your mission and your values to keep you on track, uh, having a clear strategy, uh, which I have, um, uh, which I think is fundamental uh, that you know where you're trying to get to and how you're trying to get to get there. Uh, on the final slide, the um, 
uh, investing in our staff, uh, developing our systems for financial control, communications, and so on, having a clear fundraising plan, uh, facilitating your networking, and uh, broadening your impact. Uh, you can't become sustainable and relevant if you remain in the communities uh, and with the beneficiaries you start with. You need to find ways of uh, building on, on your good work, uh, extending it to other areas, and eventually working with bigger partners to expand your work. I think my time is, uh, is just about up, so I, I will finish there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John, for uh, I think that's a very relevant slides because uh, before we started this webinar, we are also in this seminar with the Food Security Working Group and uh, MCDRR in Myanmar talking about these issues around uh, local NGO strengthening. And uh, we just started our meeting with a vision. And, uh, and, uh, and, and many of the organizations here are, have really like big vision of rural development, resilience, uh, contribution to governance and all. But I would like to uh, go back to your point about uh, earlier, you mentioned about program impact. And one of the key challenges that we always deal with local NGOs is with when, because impact most of the time is equated to having numbers. And this is where the challenge for local NGOs because they work small, they work local, you know, one village. And, uh, and how do you think would be like a way forward so that uh, you know, local NGOs in the countries would be able to while they continue doing uh, local community development work, which is really important, how can they, you know, as a sector, create some uh, united message around impact? Because looking at impact for each organization might be uh, too small if we refer impact as like numbers and all. So. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I got your two themes there. Your voice was breaking up a little bit. Uh, just a quick word on vision. Um, many of us uh, are inspired on very broad visions, which are very long term, almost dreams of what we want society to look like in the long term. One of the first challenges is to, is to bring that vision down to something which is more accomplishable in a shorter period of time, uh, which is where we normally talk about the mission or sometimes the goals, which are more measurable uh, and which we should be more accountable for. And that's really the piece of the vision that we will try to achieve within a more limited time. Um, I think impact is, a, is, is really one of the most complex and demanding issues for NGOs to, to deal with. Um, yes, we have indicators which we can measure and we can uh, collect data and analyze in a cost-effective way, but that rarely tells the, the full story of impact. Um, case studies, of course, testimonials are an excellent way to move forward uh, with photographs before and after in communities, quotes from people who've had their lives and their families impacted. Uh, that kind of uh, first-person testimonial is very a very powerful way of demonstrating uh, re real impact uh, that, that we've had. Um, I think a challenge for NGOs is in the, in the business of trying to generate funding for our work. Sometimes we're over ambitious in terms of what we can achieve, both in terms of uh, what we try to do in a year, what we try to achieve as an output, uh, and even what we want to try and spend. It's almost a natural tendency in our organizations that if everything goes well, we will achieve this, this, and this. And of course, rarely does it happen. And then we get into difficulties of underspending and underachievement. When in fact, we're doing an excellent job. So it is a real challenge, I think, for a program manager and the, the management team around them to come up with reasonable objectives, um, which we can demonstrate which will, which will, if you like, be enough to sell the project, but not overcommit ourselves in terms of uh, getting the impact that we're, we're shooting for. 
I hope that's helpful and I've answered what you were yes. trying to get at. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, John. I think we will have uh, more opportunities later to, to, to go back to you, some of your points you raised in that slide. But uh, at, at, this, at this point, I would like to uh, call on uh, Sheena to share to us about this NGO Disaster Preparedness Program. Uh, this program has been like uh, running for like a number of years today, and I think uh, we we would like to see like how this uh, partnership project uh, address some of the key questions that we raised earlier about impact, sustainability, uh, the growing role and increasing participation of local NGOs in the humanitarian sector in each country. So I I I. I I, th I think Sheena can share more about NGODPP. Sheena? Sure. Uh, thank you, Wilson. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I'll say good morning and good afternoon to Asia, but it's nighttime here in uh, the west coast of the U.S. Um, but I'm glad that uh, I, I'm able to join this and to at least virtually get to connect with some of you. Um, so I think this has been a really great introduction to our bigger network and um, many of you I'm sure are already familiar with the NGO DPP program but for those of you who aren't uh, just really quickly um, like Wilson mentioned this was we're now in phase two of a program that started uh, almost three years ago and uh, it's a program that was uh, granted by the Margaret A Cargill Philanthropies which is a foundation of sorts that's based out of the US um, and they've really been promoting preparedness and, um, you know, have been talking about how to better fund uh, long-term resilience when it comes to disaster work generally in the region, both in Africa and in Asia. And so um, Gift to Asia has uh, brought in IRR as a key strategic partner into this work that we're doing um, to really uh, give the capacity building and technical experience that they've had in the region um, and, and really focusing on community-led solutions. Um, and so just, you know, our first phase, we had certain geographies that we were in. We're kind of tightening that and figuring out uh, in this phase two how to deepen some of those relationships and our presence, um, but we're also looking to expand it. So this community of practice is really about seeing how wide our net can can cast and um, you know bringing in as many community-based organizations and NGOs that are really looking at locally led solutions to disaster preparedness and I think one of the things um, IRR and Gifts Asia have both felt is that there are a lot of opportunities for international NGOs um, even national level NGOs to kind of connect, but at a community community based level, I think they we found that there aren't very good robust networks um, that are serving uh, community needs and um, and the leadership that we have across Asia. And so we're hoping through this community of practice that we get to engage many more of you and um, really hear from you about what you would like to see happening, um, what's the current conversation happening in your countries, what support you need, um, and, and help you do your work better. Um, so the, the kind of the other big piece of this that uh, Gifts Asia is working on um, is really bringing the donor visibility piece to community-led disaster risk reduction. And uh, a lot of this is thought leadership. So you know, how do we educate donors on what's important to fund? Um, you know, instead of going through big INGOs and parachuting in during a disaster, why aren't we focusing more on preparedness? Um, why aren't, are we not um, talking about, you know, long-term resilience and the long-term plans following a disaster? And so a lot of our role at Give to Asia is also to be bringing um, some of you know what we were talking about before the impact, um, it, the lessons learned, um, and create really create an evidence base for uh, donors to understand why this is important and why they should be giving money at the local level. 
so um, that's that's it's a harder conversation. Um, you know, it, it's it's about really changing people's understanding of disasters and the nature of climate change, and really talking um, big picture about um, you know what what's happening in the world. And so, um, what what would be really great from this community is to get your experiences, get your lessons, get your successes, and hopefully be a little more analytical about how we bring that information up to donors. So instead of, you know, being only anecdotal or just doing storytelling, which is an important piece, also having the numbers, the data, um, good m and &E systems built in so that we're capturing and tracking, um, you know, the good work that's happening. And so um, hopefully through the work that we're doing at NGODPP, we can, we can help, um, you know, highlight all the work that you're doing as well. Um, I just have about a minute. Uh, Wilson, is there anything specific beyond that that um, I missed that I can cover? Yeah, I, I think one one of the uh, key ch challenge we always face is that you know how do we how do we uh, work towards changing this understanding among the donor sector? So I don't I don't know if you have uh, anything to say. Like, what are the trends? Like, you are you are uh, in the US. So what are some of the growing realities? Are, are, are there like conversations happening now in the US that, sure. that tries to shift this understanding of not just funding disaster relief and response, but also funding preparedness and resilience? Because that has always <laughs> been a challenge for the DRR sector. Uh, like any notes on or views on that, like conversations that are happening sure. in the US? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, one of the, the big trends that's happening right now is where private sector philanthropy uh, wants to be within the discussion of humanitarian work. So largely this has been led um, by either governments or multilateral institutions or, you know, like the UN. Um, and they have a lot of bureaucracy. They've got certain people that they fund. They have uh, prescriptive ways of doing things a lot of times and private sector in the US is very agile they can um, they can decide how to use their money and they've got a lot of it uh, when you're thinking of the Gates Foundation we're talking about 20 billion dollars right in endowment um, and there are many institutions like that that are based in the US that are having these conversations right now about what their role should be and uh, Gift to Asia has been a part of a convening of some of these bigger donors in the U.S. And the topic at hand is how to advance local leadership in humanitarian causes. And uh, so I think from the private sector philanthropy side, um, we're going to be seeing a lot of changes in the coming year and a lot more conversation coming from them about how to get more local, how to build local capacity, interest in funding at the local level, and really kind of taking more risks um, because they can. They're not bound by some of these uh, you know, institutional uh, legacies that historically, I think, have been funding disaster work. Um, and so I, I, I can tell you that a lot of people with a, a lot of means and a lot of interest are, are talking about local leadership within DRR, absolutely. And hopefully, um, we're going to be closer to those conversations in the coming months. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sheena. So uh, I'd like to remind our participants there's a Q&A box and a chat box. If you have any specific questions uh, to a, a speaker or some general questions, I'm also inviting my uh, participants here in the room. So if you have any questions, you can uh, write it on paper and give it to Yin and give it to me, then I can ask those questions. Uh, to our speakers. So while our participants are, are doing that, maybe I will uh, talk a little bit about this community of practice. And uh, the community of practice really is, uh, it's like a collection of a gathering of local NGOs uh, where IRR and Give to Asia has done programming work uh, for the past uh, four years. And the uh, idea of this community of practice is really to <laughs> Uh, while local NGOs, they work on local problems and local initiatives and projects, they are also uh, magnifying the impact by working as, as a community. 
you know, by by uh, by building alliances, by forming consortiums, so that they can have better chances in accessing uh, large grants where they can implement projects as a consortium. That was the vision of that committee of practice to build that that uh, committee. That uh, uh, it's more not it's not just about sharing experiences, but it's also about building relationships uh, among organizations, sharing and experiencing similar challenges, maybe not uh, within Myanmar and even outside of Myanmar. And uh, the the website that we have. Uh, so last year, just before the website, so last year, we did the consultation conferences in three countries, so one in the Philippines, one in Nepal, and then one in Indonesia, to gather these uh, organizations. And in that meeting, we were able to put, like we were able to get uh, feedback from about 100 local organizations. And one of the key actions that we have agreed is that each country will have their own face-to-face -face learning events. And in this case, in Myanmar, this is their, one of the learning events that IRRR has supported of so gathering alliances to talk about a specific topic that shown in the conference, strengthening local NGOs. And uh, next month, uh, uh, ne next month we have uh, some uh, consultation and training also in uh, Timor Leste. Uh, we'll have a chance to meet some of our NGO partners in Indonesia. And uh, so that's one, uh, uh, facilitating some face-to-face -face events. But the other uh, component of our community of practice, because we want to leverage the use of technology to build this community. So we are putting up a website to, uh, sorry about that. Uh, huh? So we have uh, put the website uh, that will show the that will serve as the landing page for the community. Just a few seconds. Uh, uh, the, Okay, it's fine. Share screen. Good. Uh, sorry. Okay. So this is our uh, our website for the disaster preparedness community of practice learning platform. So in this uh, website, this is optimized for uh, both in the desktop and in the mobile you know, smaller screen. I think what we are seeing now is, because the resolution in the projector is rather small, we're seeing some of uh, this more like a, a mobile uh, resolution. But what you will find in this website is that uh, you will have the, uh, it will have an about page. No, 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 that's not one we'll have an about page uh, where you can see the projects and it will also have stories from the field that we have collected like this one is uh, from uh, G1 Development Foundation in the Philippines, one of our partners who have implemented uh, community disaster preparedness projects. And uh, Wilson, sorry to interrupt. One second, uh, I think your screen is uh, pushed to the side if you don't mind uh, repositioning it. So everyone can see. I think it might be the projector. Yeah, I, I think it's the, the, my screen is white, but the projector is square. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, but this is the website. It's uh, you can you can see stories from the field that's contributed by the local NGOs that are participating. Uh, we have feature stories, and uh, and then uh, what are the key contents? You we have a discussion forum, which uh, we will every month we will select a topic based on the consultations 
like some of the key topics that were described by the participants that they really want to learn uh, more is uh, okay. Uh, you see that? You see that one now? No. Yes, we yeah, can. Perfect. It's okay. Yes, it's good. So, uh, so this uh, we have a discussion board, like a forum, uh, which every month we will post a focus question for participants to contribute their ideas and experiences. So, some of the topics that we have lined up for the year, we look at uh, fundraising for DRR, local and international. We have identified inclusion, like how do we bring about participation of the vulnerable sectors of women, indigenous communities, uh, people with disabilities, and uh, children and youth and the elderly. So all these, uh, you know, inclusion topics. We also talk about innovations, like how we can uh, develop with other expert technical agencies to develop innovative technologies and products that will enhance community disaster preparedness. So like, uh, for example, in the current program, we have a project in Bangladesh where uh, we are putting uh, safety and navigation and early warning equipment to the fishing boats so that they will have more, uh, they, are, they will be safer when they are going out at sea to, you know, it's using technology to, uh, to address those risks. Uh, we also have uh, resources. So when we say resources, these are, you can see publications in this uh, page. So right now you will see some of the manuals that are there, top resources, we have books. Uh, we will continue to, to populate this. So I encourage the participants or others, uh, you know, other organizations to send us material so we can put this in the website for everybody to access and learn from. And, you know, this can be an entry point to build partnerships and collaboration with your organization. And then uh, we also have a donation page, which is a link to the Give to Asia IRRR Disaster Preparedness Fund. So if there's like a donor interested to support this, this overall initiative of disaster preparedness, that donor can go to this page and contribute maybe a few uh, you know, uh, funding to, to help generate resources to support these initiatives. And then, uh, and then we also have, uh, uh, like, you know, if you want to contribute, you click this, you, you will click this and you will uh, arrive at this page where you will fill up a form. You know, we encourage you to share books, uh, manuals, posters, training materials, brief, primer, journal, paper, research, any learning materials that you have in your organization. We will uh, curate them, you know, we will categorize them, and then we will put them in the site so that it will be made available to uh, organizations. And, uh, uh, okay. and then for this year, we also, this is our first webinar. We have three more webinars scheduled for this year. And uh, we have uh, prepared, uh, we, are have, we are scheduling something, some, sometime next month on uh, inclusive the DRR. And we have in the next quarters uh, up to December, some uh, topics on finance, on fundraising for DRR, innovations in DRR. So I encourage you to visit this page and see some of the webinars that are available. And we are also working closely with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy who has like tons of learning events that local NGOs can also participate. They have free webinars, free online courses. So you can uh, visit the, the, this uh, kayaconnect.org. That's the learning platform of the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. Joining there is free. You can uh, and then get access to uh, like a lot of learning uh, materials and learning events that you can all uh, participate. And uh, whatever uh, things I forgot. Uh, and then it has also uh, some country. So if you click some of the countries, let's say uh, Bangladesh, then it will uh, open up to uh, 
uh, this page where you will see some uh, risk profile of Bangladesh. So in a glance, you will see what's the situation in the country and some description. What are the learning themes that the community of practice in Bangladesh wants to focus their discussion? And then your articles, resources that are specific for Bangladesh and all the NGO contacts. So if you want to know an NGO working in this part of Bangladesh, then you can get the names and contact them. So really, we want this site to be like your portal if you want to build uh, you know, partnerships and collaboration with other organizations within the country and outside the country. So finally, the, in terms of countries, we have uh, eight countries that are in this website. Uh, uh, in, in, this, in this website, uh, uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and uh, India. So I will stop at that. Uh, any questions that have been raised? From the participants here, this side. Maybe if you did not write, if you have anything to ask our speakers. Uh, I don't know, Julia, if there are questions. Or Louis, that the uh, Q&A were... So this is the web address, dppasia.net. So that's the address of the website. Yes, there are questions. Hey. Okay, so we have a we have a question here. I don't know, maybe John is familiar with with this to respond. But the question is: uh, there is a measure about organizational development. We call it the organizational development index. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that, John. But uh, anything you want to say about how how can we is that is that a uh, that's something that local NGOs should think about, you know, like having a score about their organizational development status. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think organizational assessment is something that every organization should do every two or three years um, and use that as a basis for further development, institutional organizational development. And such tools actually have um, scores on many of the things I listed in my presentation. Um, but I, I, I really hope this project can find a way to link uh, much bigger funding bases to um, local NGOs. This has been a, ch well, not just local NGOs, but even INGOs that work in capacity building for local NGOs. Um, because in the decades I've been in this business, we've never really been the focus of the large-scale official donor aid. Uh, maybe with more private uh, companies, uh, foundations coming into this, uh, we can try to find ways to really get resources to those who are working with communities on the ground. But the challenge for these uh, locally-based NGOs it, are many. Uh, and it's extremely difficult for them to get the resources to invest in the organizational infrastructure that will sustain them. Um, and all too often, it is the donors and the large INGOs that get sustained and, and not the local NGOs. And I think that's our challenge for how we can build that capacity and find resources to, uh, to back it up. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are so many challenges uh, to, to building a sustainable NGO that go way beyond your commitment to good work at the community level. Uh, and that's not easy for, for local NGOs to build at the same time as they're building effective programs. So effective capacity building and uh, resources uh, that do recognize uh, the time it takes to be successful at community-driven development is, um, is really crucial. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, John. Uh, we have a number of questions that are raised in the Q&A. In the so the, the Q&A, they have a question, I think you have three now. Uh, like what have you discussed, the emerging role of NGOs? Do we have a blueprint, like a model 
that local NGOs can uh, follow? I think that's a good question from Mark Cervantes. We also have a question from Shamim uh, on the like long-term support of, of a development partner. What what do you think is the role of a long-term uh, development partner? And uh, and Dong Wanya, Dong Wanya is the Academy Center Director. Like, is there a plan to expand the COP beyond countries covered by IRRR uh, Give to Asia? And uh, also, I'm receiving some questions that uh, maybe this was raised in the chat box. Uh, this is about why focus on disaster preparedness and not about bigger uh, things. So why just preparedness? And uh, so I will, uh, I will, I will not be able. We, we are running out of time already uh, for this uh, this webinar. But I will just respond to that question on why disaster preparedness only and not DRRM. But I, we will send out the, the answers to the questions raised and it will be recorded, documented in, within the webinar itself, the questions that were raised. So why disaster preparedness? You know, when we were starting this program back in 2014, uh, it, it, it came to IRRR as disaster preparedness, but we also raised the same questions about it, why not just look at the entire DRRM resilience model? And one of our challenges there is communication. Like it's, it's, it's very difficult to explain, you know, the, the technical side of disaster risk reduction and management, especially to donors. Uh, but eventually what we really want really to, to happen is about uh, really preparing the community and preparedness is not just having early warning, having drills, preparedness in the whole sense, preparedness of mindset, skills, our families. It's also about development. And uh, so when we say disaster preparedness, we're actually looking at the entire, if you look at the themes of our COP, it's not just specifically looking at disaster preparedness uh, activities, but it's actually looking at the entire disaster risk reduction and management and resilience uh, community development models. Uh, it's really that the choice of word we use is really for EC, for our partners to, to grasp the idea of what, we are, uh, of what we are planning to do. So we will send out the responses to those questions and I think uh, we will conclude this webinar now. So thank you so much for our, for our, for our guests who made time to speak to us, Dr. John Batten. Thank you for joining us from Silang. Uh, thank you also to Sheena, Mishina Agarwal, who is joining us from San Francisco. I know it's late there, so we'll not uh, hold you uh, anymore in this uh, webinar. Uh, to our participants, we have uh, 19 participants who are connected to the webinar. And in, this, in the room that I am in now, we have uh, 13 to 15 uh, participants who have listened uh, to uh, who, who, who listen to our discussions and uh, so finally I, I'd like to thank our colleagues IRRR Julia arranging this Louis of HLA Dong the Academy Director for for as always the support you have extended to IRRR and to our partners in in, in, in pursuing our common goal of strengthening the humanitarian sector through training and effective capacity development. So on that note, I would like to thank you all and see you in the next uh, webinar. Thank you, Wilson. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.